Throughout time, we have seen bank heists and robberies portrayed in movies and TV shows, and they are often high octane, adrenaline fueled, and exciting. But times have changed, and no longer are the most sophisticated and lucrative heists carried out by a crew of heavily armed robbers. Instead, it is cyber criminals behind computer screens that stand to make the most money. In today's episode, we will take a look at three separate cybercrime stories, attacks, and events told by three different cybercrime and crypto experts. First, we'll hear from a blockchain forensics investigator who shares a story how they teamed up with McAfee to tackle Netwalker ransomware, a ransomware that has been franchised within the cybercrime underworld. Secondly, we are joined by the CEO and founder of a digital forensics firm to discuss their work with a crypto mining marketplace which came to the company for help in response to a $67 million crypto hack perpetrated by the North Korean military. And finally, we are joined by the CTO of a cryptocurrency payment platform to discuss how a DEA agent and secret service agent stole bitcoins from the Silk Road owner and got caught because of bitcoins traceability. Stay tuned to the end to listen to that one, it's well worth it. And if this episode sounds like your cup of tea, then some other Brains Bite Back episodes you should listen to are Bitcoin FOMO, How Our Psychology Drives the Price of Bitcoin, Ex-Cybercrime Police Officer on the Evolution of Fighting Cyber Threats, and Professional Ransomware Negotiator and CEO Discusses Hackers' Sly Tactics and How to Defend Yourself. And don't forget to follow Brains Bite Back on your favorite podcast platforms, including YouTube, and we now have a Brains Bite Back subreddit. You can now find it by typing in reddit.com slash r slash brains bite back. And as always, that's bite with a Y. Now time to dive into the episode. Hi, my name's Sam Breakgear and you're listening to Brains Bite Back, your podcast exploring the intersection between psychology and technology. For our first story, we are joined by Pamela Clegg, Director of Financial Investigations and Education for CypherTrace, an intelligence company working to eradicate financial crimes and provide prevention strategies in the cryptocurrency and blockchain spaces. Pamela has conducted training sessions and spoken on cryptocurrency and financial crimes globally, including presentations at Interpol, Europol, and other international and federal organizations. Prior to joining CypherTrace, Pamela was the Assistant Vice President BSA and Information Security for First State Bank. She also has more than 10 years in international investigations, due diligence, and operations, working primarily in Latin America for the U.S. government. You know, in 2020, CypherTrace, we, we started working with a group, uh, McAfee, um, obviously well known within cybersecurity. And we began looking at NetWalker, NetWalker ransomware. What's really interesting about NetWalker is that it's one of these um, ransomware as a service type ransomwares that we saw really emerge within the past few years, which is kind of like, I, I find it interesting because you're franchising out right? Ransomware. Like I'm going to build this product. I'm going to build, you know, this really awesome ransomware. And then I'm going to sell it to others who want to go out and use it and make money, um, you know, relatively quickly because they're not having to actually, you know, invest in the malware themselves. So ransomware as a service was really pretty prevalent in 2020 and NetWalker was one of those. Um, So the way it kind of broke down was the creators of the ransomware, of the the actual malware, they generally get about 20% of the, the intake of the, of the gain that the actual deployers are, are earning off of the ransomware. So this, we see this breakdown of 80-20 between the profits. And so you can really see that in the crypto flows and the payment flows coming out of the NetWalker uh, victim payments. So it's quite clear and quite distinct where you see the, you know, this 20% going to the creators of, of NetWalker And then you see the other 80% going to those that actually, you know, kind of invested in the franchise and bought the, bought the malware and and, and deployed it. One of my most interesting things about NetWalker, I think, is the way that both groups have completely different motivations, right? The, the creators of, of NetWalker, who knows what their ultimate motivation is, but it doesn't appear to be entirely financial. And I say that because the, the 20% that they're raking in, in profits, which, you know, they initially launched NetWalker, they initially launched that strain on their own and made their own little chunk of change in the beginning. And then they started, you know, franchising this out. But th- those payments that they're getting, um, they're not in a hurry to spend that crypto. And we're primarily talking Bitcoin here. Uh, NetWalker primarily uh, operates in, with Bitcoin payments. But they're not in a hurry to spend it. And that, that's, I think, what makes it so interesting 
is seeing the difference in the individuals who are actually you know buying that that particular strain of malware and deploying it themselves they are very quite clearly in this for financial gain because you see those funds come in and then you see them very quickly move throughout the crypto ecosystem and cash out at different exchanges whereas the netwalker creators they have almost like a vault they have a cold wallet right so in cryptocurrency we would refer to um, a cold wallet as you know a kind of like a storage like a like a vault that it's not online so it's not susceptible to being hacked it's not susceptible to malware or anything like that where somebody could come in and um, somehow you know exfil your your private key um, but so they they kind of collect they have a, a particular address that has over 600 bitcoin sitting at this particular address and it's just it's just sits there and it just continually receives you know, different payments that they kind of just funnel in off of all these different activities. And so that's, that to me, I think is, is what makes it really interesting is looking at the different psyches, the, the different motivations um, behind the actors that are using this, ex the same strain. And um, what is, what is their ultimate goal? Well, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not financially motivated, or maybe they're just hodlers waiting for <laughs> Bitcoin to rise a bit more it's true maybe, but, maybe they're hopping and they're waiting for that hundred thousand yeah. mark right before they cash out so if it's not financially motivated do you have any like uh, speculations as to why they might be doing this or the the motivation behind their their actions here well you know so you're right it could be financially motivated um but they're just maybe not in a hurry which i always kind of talk about you know the best way for you to avoid having your cryptocurrency traced is to just not move your cryptocurrency, right? So if my job is to track down your funds and trace down what, you know, you know, track you down and trace, trace to where you, you've sent your funds to cash out or use your funds or however, whatever it is that we're looking for, the best way to avoid that is to just not move it. And we've actually seen this with other hackers, you know, some of the most successful ones are the ones that will actually execute a hack pull the funds into you know, a particular location or maybe divvy them up into between different addresses and then just leave them. And they'll leave them for a while. So maybe it's not a question of being financially motivated, it's just a question of they're more patient than the others. So they leave them for a couple of years, let's say they leave them for two or three years. I think that in their mind that, you know, this is just gonna fall off somebody's radar. To find out more about the work Pamela and the Cypher Trace team are doing, you can follow the link in the bio and visit their website where they regularly produce articles, blogs, and quarterly reports focusing on the cryptocurrency ecosystem. For our next story, we are joined by Andre Krell, CEO and founder of Lifeass, a digital forensics firm that performs hostage and ransomware negotiations using military trained experts. Andre has worked with the FBI, DHS, Interpol, and many other government organizations on cyber defense and threat hunting. Andre shares the story of how him and his team help respond to a $67 million crypto hack perpetrated by the North Korean military. And the biggest mistakes companies make when it comes to their cybersecurity. It is not really unknown that varying nation state groups, meaning that the groups that are sponsored by the nation itself, by their agencies, are getting involved also in criminal activities. Meaning that not only they focus on the government, but they focus on commercial targets. We were in uh, 2017 asked to conduct a forensic investigation into a company in a cryptocurrency market where a compromise happened in their system and around $60 million in Bitcoin have been stolen and transferred out of the system. And at that point of time, we realized what we're dealing are not just simple criminals. But the compromise itself, is not just some level of criminal enterprise that would be compromising this uh, entity. It turned to be a highly skilled and focused nation state trade actor, which was recently attributed by the Department of Justice to North Korea. If you look at the North Korean group called Lazarus and their activities, you probably will find that around two billions worth of Bitcoins have been stolen by this group. The way they approached the victim was they touch the infrastructure, meaning they review what kind of operating systems the key members at that company did have. This was a Slovenian type of 
exchange. And a few of them are really famous ones actually have been created in that region, meaning that we did have to go from New York to, uh, to the US, from US to Slovenia, and we had to co conduct what we call the evidence preservation on the site. The Lazarus group itself is very skilled, very well sponsored, uh, very well trained. And when they touch the original systems, their goal was very simple determine what kind of weaknesses this enterprise actually has and how hard it would be to pivot from their computers into the infrastructure that was hosting in a data center in the Netherlands and uh, stole all the Bitcoins. Most of the cryptocurrency companies at that point of a time did not have something what we call the hot and cold wallet. The one thing that cryptocurrency doesn't do well, it's not really used for banking. Since it's a peer-to-peer -peer model, it's more of sharing among each other versus banking. So cryptocurrency doesn't have a concept of banking, meaning that every of these exchanges has to create wallets that basically they can almost shut down. They, they, sometimes they call them cold wallets. You can imagine almost like a bank account that only you know of, and then you have a checking account that you operate on a market with, meaning you're making all the payments. So if that checking account operates, it only has funds for you to operate, like let's say for a week, and then it's replenished. So most of these exchanges at that point of time did not have a practices, like a better practices of banking, meaning everything was sitting in one wallet that was actually visible to threat actors with the understanding, most likely if they get into that wallet, then they can basically steal money. If the company was basically moving from that wallet money into the cold wallet, it would be much harder for threat actor to penetrate that cold wallet and uh, take the Bitcoin funds and uh, cash them. In addition, many of these companies, they don't have the most comprehensive security programs. They were growing very quickly, many of these exchanges. And if you see how many of them they're hacked, then you realize that this is quite a bit in portfolio. It's almost like $2 billion has been stolen. So you have maybe right now up to 20 victims of North Korea attacking these exchanges. But their security practices were not sufficient to the adversary they were dealing with, meaning that for nation state type of threat actor, a systematic approach into security, like how they work with the endpoints, how they work with the detection on a network level and how they work at a perimeter or software defined perimeter is very important. The initial vector into many of these exchanges was simply a spare phishing email, meaning that someone at the IT department or someone at the high executive level receive a spare phishing email. The email has a cascading effect, meaning that when, you, when someone actually opened that email, it ran another piece of code. That piece of code ran another piece of code. That piece of code ran another piece of code. Simple obfuscation had been used in this cascading effect so it would avoid detection on the endpoint where the user was actually sitting. And then the threat actor basically gained the access to that system and uh, work in a privilege of the user, often elevated the privileges on the network and um, laterally move from the system to system that they need to actually see. Damn, it seems that every time hacking comes up within uh, these conversations that I have on this podcast, it's almost always comes back to human error to some extent and especially phishing emails, those seem to be so so prevalent and uh, so dangerous. Some of you know something here, but also believe in misconception that most of the organizations do believe that technology solves security, and it doesn't. They believe that whatever they have on their endpoints, on their network, is superior, and how they monitor it, it's superior to everyone else. And the answer is not. Like the nation state group just proves the individuals who believe that technology is just just the technology is the solution to cybersecurity wrong there is a element of humans that is needed to on professional level to master that detection because yes we can't think that there is a human error and there always going to be right like, like, like when someone said it, that a sample is impossible to patch the dna of people we are who mm. we are right we're going to go and click on an email we're going to do something silly i don't think there is anyone who would not have something that he would not want to tell his parents that he's done silly. Yeah. It's, it's just the reality and nature of who we are. So these things are going to happen. 
But a lot of the companies says, well, we don't really worry about that. We don't really worry what about the email and phishing. And the answer is like, why, why you don't worry? Well, you don't understand. We have the superior security on endpoint. We have this detection that comes into place. And that's a big misconception. Mm -hmm. Many of these even exchanges, they live in idea that what they do internally is sufficient. Well, I, t I tell everyone, look, regardless how you are prepared, regardless how you think you're detecting monitoring, this is no different than catching the cold or at some point have really bad cancer. Mm. None of us knows what we're gonna get. But one thing is very certain, and that is that we are going to be sick in our lifespan. Mm. There's hardly a human that did not have any sickness while he was living on Earth. Mm. Like the cyber is not different now. In a cyber, everyone's gonna be touched. And it can be touched you know, in a very pleasant way, but it can be touched in the wrong way. Yeah. It's not different than the human life. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't really think or be oblivious to the fact that it's going to happen. The reality is when it happens, are you ready to detect it? Are you ready to contain, eradicate, isolate those systems and react quickly? Look, mm -hmm. we live in an era of viruses spreading through cyber ecosystem, like through, you know, just the same way as they spreading through normal, right? Like humans and, uh, and we see the damages. This is no different in the cyber world. This being, this what we see right now, is a reflection of 10 years of cyber world. Imagine the same is happening in the cyber world. We just really don't talk about it because it doesn't affect it's, well, it's not killing people, right? Like it's, let's say ransomware kills one person here over there when the 911 or some emergency line are not available. Mm. But this battle in the cyber world has been going on for at least, like very actively for at least less than 10 years by cyber criminals. And what used to be a game of privilege or Cyber James Bond 007. Now it's almost like if you go to GitHub or some of the some of the sites, which again nothing against them, but you can publish any cyber code you want, and that cyber cyber code can be a cyber bazooka to kill all your radio tomorrow, mm. and it's illegal, right? We we don't have any traits on how you deal cyber weapons. What you, what is cyber weapon? How is it actually being used? What level you can do? It's almost like Imagine you walk out tomorrow from your building and on the street, a guy is selling Kalashnikov, uh, RPG, like, okay, so pay hundred bucks for this, 300 for that, right? This is the market we're dealing with. On a black market, you can buy any cyber tank, any cyber jet fighter for not a lot of money. Hopefully you're enjoying the show. And if you are, make sure you subscribe and never miss an episode. You can find us on all your usual podcast sites, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, and a whole lot more, including YouTube. And we want to hear what you think, so be sure to leave us a review. Just search Brains Bite Back wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up to date with Andre and the work his team is doing, you can follow them on the company's LinkedIn page and Andre's personal LinkedIn page. You'll find a link to this in the episode's description. For our final story, we are joined by Ritas Bilyauskas, CTO of cryptocurrency payment platform CoinGate, to discuss how a DEA agent and a secret service agent stole Bitcoins from the Silk Road owner and got caught because of Bitcoin's traceability. Now this story is a slow burner, but make sure you stay around until the end because it gets really good. Probably a lot of people have heard about Silk Road. So Silk Road was the first marketplace on the darknet, on so-called darknet. So a darknet is like a hidden internet, which you can only access using a special browser and where it's very hard to track who is visit visiting what website and where the servers for those websites are located. So Silk Road was the first and uh, largest dark market website where uh, the main thing that was sold there was uh, illegal drugs. And uh, it got closed. The uh, creator of this uh, marketplace was convicted and sent to prison for two, I believe for two consecutive life sentences. So a lot of people know this story, but uh, not a lot of People know that also there were other people convicted related uh, with this case and not just people who were selling or buying drugs, but also two government law enforcement agents. 
So there was one uh, DEA agent and one Secret Service agent. This so story is also like public, so it's not like I'm I'm telling about anything like secret, but it's just not uh, as widely known as the main Silk Road story. So uh, the whole story of of how it happened was that there was a DEA, DEA agent uh, named Force who has been uh, extorting uh, the admin and creator of the Silk Road, uh, whose name was Dread Pirate Robbers, like nickname or a shorthand DPR. Uh, the, the agent got caught by trying to launder those Bitcoins and trying to exchange them into fiat and the way it, it, it happened is quite interesting uh, so how it started is this agent force uh, he opened an account at a slovenian bitcoin exchange called bitstam and he did it under his undercover name the name he was using as an undercover identity uh, when working as the EA agent and he used uh, like fake documents fake proof of residence and other fake info of that undercover identity to register an account. Uh, the person uh, who was Bitstamp's general counsel uh, named George Frost noticed that these documents were actually sophisticated forgeries. So Frost confronted Force asking him what's up and Force admitted that this was a fake ID uh, and told him that Yes, actually, I'm a DA agent, sent him his real ID, real water bill, a copy of his badge, and explained that uh, he learned about Bitcoin uh, through investigating Silk Road and is now trying to sell some coins related to that. Well, uh, at first he raised some red flags, but didn't raise a large enough suspicion to stop those transactions, so Bitstamp uh, let it through, but also uh, Frost uh, contacted FinCEN, an agency which deals with financial crimes, and the contact at FinCEN was named uh, Sean Bridge, a Secret Service agent uh, with whom uh, Frost had worked with previously. Frost informed uh, FinCEN about uh, these events, but nothing happened, nothing changed. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Force was selling more and more Bitcoins. For example, in December of 2013, he had already uh, uh, paid his mortgage in full, which was about $130,000 outstanding. And then in April 2014, uh, uh, several months after uh, DPR's arrest, the admin uh, of Silk Road arrest, uh, Force uh, made another big withdrawal. So this time he sent about $80,000 to himself. And then later the same month, he tried to do a fourth withdrawal, the biggest yet of $200,000. Uh, but this time Frost decided to freeze the account so he could get better answers. And like I mentioned, he already contacted federal authorities um, because he thought that this agent's behavior was uh, suspicious. Uh, so uh, then also Frost uh, met with uh, Catherine Hahn, uh, an assistant United States attorney uh, in San Francisco's Department of Justice, uh, who was uh, a Department of Justice's uh, first digital currency coordinator. Also at the meeting, uh, was Tigran Gambarian, another special agent with the Internal Revenue Service in nearby town of Oakland. Uh, so Hon and Gambarian were a bit on the fence whether they should start investigating this at all because uh, they were a bit reluctant to start investigating another agent without some really suspicious activity or some definite proof. And so far they didn't think that existed. But then something happened which made them look into this much closer because Force messaged Bitstamp and asked them to delete all the uh, history in his account, all of the records. Well, and then uh, it was 
obvious to them that they should investigate force because it was quite obvious he was now trying to hide uh, the traces of things that he did. So when they started to investigate force, they needed to learn how to trace digital currency in the same way that they were used to track other black market transactions. Uh, well, but they were not sure at first uh, how they, they can trace Bitcoin. Um, but the beautiful thing with Bitcoin is that every single transaction is public. Uh, so that's uh, Bitcoin's one of the greatest features, but it's also uh, greatest liability for would-be criminals because everything is on the record forever because the blockchain of Bitcoin is a giant public ledger where everyone can see all the data and no one can hide it, no one can delete it, no one can edit it. So uh, when investigating those transactions, they found that Force had used in total three different online uh, identities to communicate with the admin of Silk Road. Uh, the first identity he created was called Knob, and this is the uh, identity which Force officially uh, created and which was told about in the in the investigation of Silk Road. So using that transaction, Force contacted the admin of Silk Road and at first uh, he offered to buy Silk Road. Then the DPR asked $1 billion worth of Bitcoin for that. So he, the, the agent canceled that idea. But that uh, helped Force to go into contact with DPR. Then Force, acting as uh, this fake identity knob, complained to DPR that uh, he wants to sell a large amount of drugs, but on Silk Road there are no buyers for large amounts uh, of drugs. He wrote that he wanted to sell at least 10 kilos. DPR wrote back that he might be able to help with that. And the next day, he sent uh, details of a moderator on Silk Road, whose nickname was Flash. Well, long story uh, short, because it's not exactly related to this, the agents and force included were able to arrest this person named Flash, uh, get his login details, and then they uh, uh, logged in as Flash to Silk Road. So uh, what the logs of Silk Road show that someone logged in as Flush and started sending huge amounts of Bitcoins to another account called number 13 and then moved out of Silk Road. And uh, other sellers which were using Silk Road were also having their Bitcoins disappear from their accounts. And by the time uh, DPR and the rest of his team uh, figured out what's going on, roughly 20,000 of Bitcoins had already disappeared. So it's interesting to note that at that time, 20,000 Bitcoins it was, were worth about 350,000 US dollars. And now they would be worth about 1 billion US dollars. So uh, DPR was very angry about this, and then uh, Force, acting as snob, contacted DPR and offered him to help with this issue. Uh, then DPR requested at first that uh, this person, Flash, who DPR thought was the one behind the theft, that this person uh, should be at first, he asked him to be beaten up and later he asked him to be uh, killed. Uh, so uh, what the agents did, they faked photos with the help of this flash guy, sent them to DPR, uh, and DPR was convinced that, okay, so this, this guy who he thought was responsible for the theft was indeed uh, killed. And uh, DPR paid uh, $80,000 in Bitcoins uh, for this service. Uh, later on 2013, April, uh, Force created another account, uh, another fake online identity called Death From Above. Uh, and then he contacted DPR saying that, hey, I know that uh, you have something uh, to do with the death of this guy. 
and uh, you have to pay me two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars, or I will let everyone know what you did. Uh, but uh, DPR at first ignored him and then replied that he's not going to pay anything. Then Force tried another idea and he created a third fake identity called uh, French Maid and offered to sell DPR information about the government's investigation into Silk Road for another $100,000 in Bitcoins. So DPR uh, paid that and it's not clear whether Force actually sent him any information or not. So during the investigation, uh, Force uh, admitted working a snob and improperly taking bitcoins that belonged to the government. But at first he did not admit that he was the one who also created the identities French made and there from above. So one of the investigators, Gambarian, uh, went back to the Silk Road database. And it took some time, uh, but he was able to confirm the suspicions that Force was acting as both French maid and Dev from above. Uh, because uh, Force had left a particular version of uh, PGP uh, email signature uh, for his uh, various personas and also, uh, he was able to determine that 525 Bitcoin payment, which was paid to one of those fake identities, actually came directly from Albright. And he was able to manually cross-reference forces and DPR's Bitcoin transactions. And that's how he was able to confirm that uh, all these accounts belonged to uh, the same agent force. He did that by using a, a recent new website, new at the time, called Wallet Explorer, uh, which was uh, able to accurately trace the history of Bitcoin payments and wallets and map wallets into so-called clusters, that is uh, mapping addresses to known entities like Silk Road, Coinbase and Bitstamp and other large Bitcoin players. And so Wallet Explorer was the beginning of so-called blockchain analysis tools. Well, but there was actually uh, more to this discovery after Gambarian uh, became more comfortable with using this blockchain analysis tool. Uh, he started to strongly suspect that there was actually another bad actor because uh, he spent dozens of hours uh, tracing the movements of bitcoins throughout the blockchain and it showed that some currency moved in small groups while others were bouncing all around in large chunks uh, and force uh, had one type of pattern uh, when he was using his money but Gambarian saw another more complicated pattern uh, which was emerging as well. So they contacted another agent, which I, I mentioned previously, Sean Bridges, and asked him for help. Uh, but instead of agreeing or offering his help, uh, Sean Bridges started to question their authority. And uh, he questioned why they are even investigating this. Uh, in the end, uh, they found out that actually this second bad actor was Sean Bridges and they again did it by using uh, blockchain analysis and tracking all transactions. Just instead of using Bitstamp, uh, Sean Bridges uh, sent uh, the stolen Bitcoins to Mt. Gox. So it was a Japan-based Bitcoin exchange that had since gone bankrupt. And they found out that Bridges used Mt. Gox to cash out the money to a Fidelity account registered to Quantum Investments, a company that Bridges had registered in his own name using his own home address. In the end, both of those agents, Force and Bridges, were convicted. Bridges was sentenced to 71 months, while Force was given 78 months. Two days before Bridges was set to report to prison, 
uh, he asked the judge for permission to turn himself in one day early, as he said due that due to snowy weather conditions that could impede the 10 hour drive from Baltimore to his assigned prison. And he was granted this request, but uh, the investigator suspected that this means Bridges was trying to actually leave the country. A team of agents surrounded his hounds and arrested him again, and he found out that it's very likely that he was actually planning to do this because he was carrying uh, ID documents and authorized copy of his passport, uh, corporate records for free offshore, offshore companies, and so on. So this is a, a story how some agents were immoral, acted illegally, and then got caught because they used Bitcoin, which has a public record of all transactions. Thank you for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed the ending as much as I did. And to find out more about CoinGate and the work Retus is doing, you can visit their website at coingate.com or follow the link in the description of this episode. Growing a company has many hurdles, from securing funding to expanding your business capabilities to ranking better on search. Each business challenge is uniquely complex. The solution to these challenges is growth-focused digital PR and marketing. And that is where our sponsor, Publicize, comes in. Publicize sets itself apart from traditional PR companies. It doesn't charge large retainers or churns out press releases whether you've got a newsworthy announcement or not. Publicize builds your business's online presence and gets high quality PR and media coverage for startups and entrepreneurs who are priced out of a broken PR industry. And for a limited time only, exclusive to Brains Bike Back listeners, you can receive an SEO assessment as part of your package for any tier of service at no extra charge with this special promotion. To find out more, visit publicize.co slash BBB. That's publicize.co slash BBB. This is the end of today's show. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this and you want to hear more episodes just like it, then follow and subscribe to Brains Bite Back wherever you get your podcasts. We're also available on YouTube under the channel of our publication, The Sociable. Just search Brains Bite Back and you'll find all of our episodes there. We really love hearing what you have to say. So leave us a review on iTunes or on any other podcasting platform to let us know what you think. You can also reach out on Twitter at, at The Sociable. And finally, go to sociable.co where you can find all our episodes and plenty of articles on topics just like this. Thanks again for joining us and until next time, stay safe and stay healthy.